Amen. So we're in the second chapter of 1 Samuel. Uh, we're getting into a new book every Thursday night. You know, we go through chapter by chapter, verse by verse through a book in the Bible. And uh, we're getting right in, starting out on a fresh start here with 1 Samuel. And of course, 1 Samuel is one of those very pivotal passages or uh, parts of the Bible. Well, we talked about last week how Samuel himself was a very pivotal individual. He came on the scene at a very critical time in Israel's history, and we see the transition, of course, in Samuel's life from them going from the system of the judges over to the system of the kings, and so on and so forth. So Samuel's a very important character, and of course, we're getting into just the beginnings of his life and some of the things that were going on around him as he was coming up as a child. And we talked about last week how uh, Hannah had come and, and offered, you know, she was barren, she wasn't able to have children, so she, and you know, this was uh, a great grief to her, so she goes uh, to the temple with Elkanah, her husband, and vows a vow to the Lord that if she would give her a man-child, that he would be lent unto the Lord all the days of his life, that no razor would come upon his head, that he would be a, a Nazarene. Uh, and, of course, we know the story that God uh, gave her that child, and, and she, of course, followed through on her promise and brought him to the Lord after she had weaned him and dedicated him unto the Lord. And he lived there from his childhood on, from the day he was weaned going forward. He lived there in the temple or rather it would be the tabernacle at that time, with Eli and came up under him and eventually took that priest's office, as we'll see in, in the upcoming chapters. But So chapter 2 starts out right after that, you know, right after she had uh, given Samuel to the Lord. You know, she'd had this child, and then she has this prayer, right? It says, and Hannah prayed, right, and said. And then she goes on there, and we read these things in her prayer. And her prayer is a, is a very powerful prayer. You know, there's a lot of things. We could probably just go verse by verse just through the prayer tonight and spend the entire night just talking about her prayer. In fact, whole sermons have been preached by other preachers, and maybe one day I'll do it too, where they just talk about this prayer. But I, I do want to point out a few things, but probably the most noteworthy thing about Hannah's prayer is the prayer itself. I mean, the fact that it's recorded at all. Okay, uh, There's a lot of prayers that are recorded in the Bible. I mean, you read the book of Psalms, we read Moses' prayers, we read you know, all kinds of different people prayed in the Bible and had their prayers written down, recorded. But do you think that's all the praying that went on throughout all of human history? This is the only prayers that ever took place? You know, I mean, people are praying all the time. People have been praying for a long time. So the fact that her prayer made it into uh, the Bible and has been written down and recorded in a book that's going to be read for all eternity is, is really something. Yeah. I mean, how would you like that to be said about one of your prayers? I would probably say, no, thank you, right? Because I'm nowhere near as eloquent as Hannah is here. You know, and, and, and the fact that she had her prayer written down is, is really something special because there's a lot of prayers that could have been written down, but hers made it in. You know, and it reminded me of Job. You know, Job was another person whose life we read about, right? And a lot of his prayers, a lot of his supplications and the things that he had to say before God are written down. And in fact, the, the thing, uh, what's interesting about Job is he actually wanted that. He, if you recall in Job 19, he said, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. I mean, that's what, pro, that's what Job actually said. Uh, that they were graven with iron pen and lead in rock forever. You know, Job might not have gotten the, the iron pen and he might not have gotten the lead rock, but he got something even more sure than that, the Word of God. The Word of God, the Bible says, will, you know, will abide forever. You know, that one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all these things be fulfilled. So, you know, Job got what he wanted. You know, he had his word. His words were written down in a book. And they're there forever. And just like Hannah, too. You know, she probably didn't want that. She probably wasn't looking for that. But uh, it's there. You know, and it's there for uh, our admonition. You know, these things are written for our admonition. There's things we can learn from Hannah's prayer. But just the fact that it's written at all. Just the fact that God records certain people's lives, certain prayers, certain events. Um, you know, that that's really something. But he also, the other thing that Hannah and Job have in common. You say, well, I, I, boy, it'd be great to have your words written down in the book, in the Bible. Well, maybe the reason they got written down was because of some of the suffering they went through. I mean, Hannah, we read in the other chapter, I mean, she had her enemy, you know, her, her I don't know if you'd call her her wife, her wife-in-law, what would you call a, a, a man's other wife? You know? Sister wife, yeah, something like that. You know, uh, her, her husband's other wife. This sounds like a Jerry Springer show now or something, right? You know, this is my husband's other wife. You know, she was, but she was vexing her. She was her adversary. She vexed her sore. She mocked her, you know, she, and it was a great sorrow of heart to her. That's where this prayer even came from. You know, it didn't, 
It came from the fact that she'd gone through all this grief and suffering and anguish and this trial. Just like Job. I mean, his, all these words of Job are written down. But consider all the things Job suffered. I mean, he lost everything in the day. All his wealth, his children, everything gone. You know, and then on top of that, you know, he's vexed with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his foot that he has to scrape with a pot shirt. You know, he has a miserable condition. So be careful what you ask for. You know, it's kind of the moral there. You want, you know, some notoriety, you know, it might come at a price. But the other thing they kind of have in common, you know, Hannah and Job, the fact that these, their words are written down, their story is told to us, is that they were humble people. You know, they were not seeking to be written down. They were not seeking this notoriety. And here's the thing, you know, if, if that's what we want in life, to be known, to people know our name and so on and so forth, it's probably never going to come. Because that's a wrong motivation. You know, Hannah is, is somebody who we know about, but that's not because she was out there trying to make a name for herself. You know, we know about her because God honored her and honored her, her, her faithfulness through the trial that she went through. Um, you know, the Bible says before honor is humility. You know, so she was honored, but it's because she was a very humble person. And really, humility is a major element of Hannah's prayer. When we read through this here, uh, she talks about, you know, the haughty being brought low and the lowly being exalted. And if you read there in uh, verse 3, it says, Talk no more exceedingly proudly, right? The exact opposite of humility. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, right? She's, she's saying, don't be a proud person. Don't say arrogant things. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that are stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry cease. So you can just see over and over again the proud being made low and the, the lowly being made uh, lifted up and exalted. He says, So that the barren hath born, born seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. Verse 6, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and, he maketh, and maketh rich. He bringeth low and he lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are their lords, and he has set the world upon them. So what's interesting, and if you recall, I actually quoted this uh, verse uh, in Psalms 113. This, I referred to this in the last, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, that, that verse 8 there. That's actually quoted in Psalms 113. If, if you recall, in 1 Samuel 1, I had us turn there, and we're going to turn there again right now. If you would, go to 1 Samuel Chapter, uh, chapter 113, or excuse me, Psalms 113. Psalms, Samuel, it's all so similar, right? Go to Psalms 113. Because <coughs> David actually quotes Hannah in Psalms 113. It's, it's pretty interesting. And he, and he says the exact same thing. If, you, if you're there in, in Psalms 113, he raiseth up the poor out of the dust. I mean, that's verbatim. And lifteth up the needy, you know, she said beggar, same thing, out of the dunghill, that, they may, and, and that he may set them with princes, even with the princes of his people. Now, that's where Hannah's, you know, ended. You know, she went on and said, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. But when David quotes it, it's interesting what's going on here. Because you have to remember, David came on the scene, you know, not much later. But I believe David knew about Hannah. And he probably even had uh, knew of this prayer. I think that's why, or maybe it's just, you know, you could say ultimately it's the Holy Ghost. But what's interesting is that, you know, whether it was David, you know, you know through his knowing it, knowingly or not, the Holy Ghost adds Hannah's testimony to her own prayer. I mean, she prayed this back in 1 Samuel, right? She says, the poor of the, the he lifted up the, raised the poor out of the dust. He lifted up the beggar from the dunghill. She prays this, right? And then and here in Psalms 113, David's quoting it. You know, he's reiterating it, but if you read on in verse 9, he actually adds the testimony of Hannah to the prayer, which I thought was interesting. Verse 9, he maketh the barren woman to keep house. That's Hannah. She was barren. He and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. So that, I thought that was very interesting that through the Holy Spirit, God, not only did he honor her prayer, but then he actually adds her testimony to that very prayer later in Psalms 113. And it's interesting, of course, because it says she make a joyful mother of children. And we know from later on here, and you know, we jump down to verse 20, 
it says, And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife, and the Lord give thee seed of this woman for the Lord, which is lent to the Lord. And, and, and they went home, uh, went unto their home, and the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. So that's why she's the joyful mother of children. She went on to have five more kids besides Samuel. So we could kind of, we could learn something from this. The fact that, you know, David, when he quotes Hannah's prayer and then God through the Holy Spirit actually puts her own testimony into that prayer is that, you know, if we want others to cite us, you know, if we want other, if we want to be uh, others to look back on our lives and cite us as godly examples like David is here with Hannah, I mean, he's looking back and he's, he's looking at her life and what God did in her life and he's using that as a means to praise God and to encourage others. You know, if we want that for our life, maybe not written in the Word of God, but maybe you want your children, you know, to look back and, and tell their children about their, their godly grandma and their godly, their godly uh, uh, grandfather. You know, let me tell you about my dad. Let me tell you about your great-grandpa. If we want that, you know, in generations to come, you know, if we want other, those that known us to, when we pass on, to say good things about us and to lift us up as a godly example, if we want that for life, well, it's real simple. You just got to be that godly example. You got to do it. You know, that's not going to happen on its own. That's something you're going to have to determine to do in your life. And say, I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going uh, to live for God and be faithful like Hannah. Even if I have to go through trials and temptations and difficulties, if it's not easy, I'm going to stay faithful to God and let him bless me in the end. My latter end shall be better. And I'll be that faithful example. You know, and my words might never be written down in a book like theirs are, but the people that matter most in your life will be able to look back and say, mom, dad, brother, sister, cut, you know, whatever the relation is, say, was a godly example, was a powerful influence in my life. So I thought that was interesting that you have David looking back and using Hannah as that godly example. And you know, in future generations, they should be able to look back on us and see us as a good example. That should be our goal. But let's move on here. Again, we could talk so much more about Hannah's prayer. There's just so much there. And she says in verse 9, He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. So just real quick to touch on this, and I read that, I thought that was interesting that he, she says, the wicked shall be silent in darkness. And of course, we know that when a person goes to hell, it's called being cast into outer darkness. Jesus said in Matthew 8, the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. Right? And he was talking about how many shall come from the east and from the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the children of the kingdom themselves shall be thrust out. Talking about how the Gentile nations were going to come and, and replace the nation of Israel at that time. But then he goes on and he says, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So when Hannah is saying the wicked shall be silent, but she's not saying that the, the people that are cast out of darkness are just going to sit there with their mouth closed. And probably one of the most frightening things about hell, I mean, besides the fire, besides the fact that the torment never ends, besides the fact that the worm never dies there, is the sound of hell. You know, and I've preached on hell in the past, and I've never done it, but I've often thought about it. And I probably never would do it for the sake of children, because the last thing you want to do is just send kids home and have nightmares and things, because it's a frightening thought. But what if we were just turn off the lights and just make it pitch black in here and then we'd all just start to scream our head off? Because that's what's going on in hell right now. That's right. And that should send chills up and down your spine. You know, and that should be, you know, if we ever, if we get ever get uncomfortable with soul winning or thinking, you know, and I understand it's hard, it gets hot, we go door to door, we're trying to knock every door in this whole city and we're going to do it Amen. just like we're doing up in Phoenix, you know, and we're, we're trying to reach the whole state, county by county, but, and doing what? Preaching the gospel, trying to get people saved. Because I they don't I don't they shouldn't have to hear that. You know, I don't want anyone to hear that. And if we ever get weary in well doing, if we ever get weary in doing that, those are the type of thoughts that should motivate us. You know, man, it's hot today in Tucson. Do I really want to go soul winning? It's a lot hotter in hell. Man, I'm afraid of what they're gonna say when I knock on their door, what they're gonna tell me off. Well, just imagine what they're gonna be saying when they end up in hell. It's gonna be a whole, whole lot worse for them. You know, it says the wicked shall be silent in darkness, but it's not because they're, they're not going to have anything to say. They're going to be screaming and writhing in agony. They're going to they're gonna be silent in darkness in the sense that they're not going to be heard. You know, we won't hear them. You know, that's, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's what she, I think, is getting across here. That w the wicked will be gone, you know. And, you know, that's, that is a good thing to think about. I mean, 
to think about the fact that wickedness will no longer be on the earth, that the wicked people, the rulers of the, of the, 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 uh, the wicked rulers of this world are going to be punished one day, and peace will prevail on earth. And that's a whole other sermon, that's a whole other can of worms that I'm opening up there, and, and um, let's just move on from that. Look at verse 10, we'll move on with their prayer, because there's a lot to get to in this chapter, it's a longer chapter. It says, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. And he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Verse 11, And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister before the Lord, before, uh, unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Now, Eli were, uh, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. When any man offered sacrifice, the priest servants came with the flesh hook and seething. Now, let me just stop right there where it says that the sons of Eli, verse 12, were sons of Belial. Okay? This isn't saying that they had two daddies. Okay? <laughs> I know we got that Jerry Springer joke going, but it's not the case. All right? What it means by sons of Belial is sons of the devil. Yep. All right? Belial uh, you know, is another word for Baal or Beelzebub. And these are all words that are synonymous with Satan or devil worship. And that's who these guys were. Now, they were the sons of Eli who was the high priest. And they themselves were the priests of the Lord in the temp at the tabernacle at that time. But they were still sons of the devil. Which should go to show you that just because somebody is in a church you know, and is wearing some you know, garb, and is standing up and, and, and saying, you know, righteous sounding things doesn't mean that they're of God. Yeah. You know, there are, you know, many false, many false prophets are, you know, are, are gone out into the world. There are many antichrists even now. Right. You know, so we should keep that in mind. And I'm actually probably going to be preaching a whole sermon on what it means to be a son of Belial. Um, that'll, you know, be coming up later. So come back for that. And then in verse 13, he says, but that's who his sons were. You know, they were reprobate false prophets is what they are and reprobate meaning you know like according to jeremiah where he said reprobate silver shall men call them for the lord hath rejected them right that's what it means to be reprobate to be rejected of god okay that's what these guys were and, and we'll see that here verse 13 and the priest's custom was with the people that when any man offered sacrifice the priest servant came while the flesh was in seething <coughs> with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand and he struck it into the pan, or the kettle, or the cauldron, or the pot. All that the flesh hook brought forth, uh, brought up to the up the priest, took for himself. So the priest's custom was when these guys were cooking their meat that they would show up with their, their you know their their big fork basically their three prong flesh hook, and they would stab it in there, and everything it brought up they just took. And again, now this says it was the priest's custom. This doesn't say and as the law told them to do. This is something that they. This is their custom with their people, and it doesn't mean it was right. <coughs> it said, All the flesh that brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did to all the Israelites that came hither. thither. So what's, uh, let me just read the rest of the passage, and we'll get into it. It says, and, bef and it says in verse 15, Also, so in addition to this, not only, before they burned the fat. So of course you understand, if you're from the Le Leviticus, when they made the off, they, they, they killed the animal at the sacrifice, God told them to burn the fat upon the altar. They were not to eat that. Okay, and, and uh, they were to burn, you know, certain portions of the animal were given to the people and to the priest to eat. And often it was the right shoulder and the breast of the animal. That's what was given to the priest. And that's what was given, um, you know, in the, pre the, the peace offerings and the sin offerings, even to the people that brought it. You know, they also got to partake in that sacrifice. But, you know, it's a whole big, long, I mean, Levitic, go read, read Leviticus. It gets real detailed how, you know, the fat and the call, which is above the liver and the kidney, you know, all that got burnt, you know, and the rest of the animal got burnt. And a lot of detail there. So they were to burn, but it's saying here in verse 15, also before they burn the fat, the fat that God said is mine, you'll burn it to me, which is the best part, right? Anyone that's had... A good steak with lots of marbled fat in it knows that that's where the flavor is. And you eat the fat, right? And he says, uh, Before they burned the fat, the priest servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. So he's saying, Look, I, I'm going to take what you're going to burn to the Lord, and we're going we're gonna to cook it. You know, we're going to eat that as well. And if any man said unto him, Let him not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, 
Then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young men, Eli's sons, right, was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred, meaning they hated or they despised or they detested the offering of the Lord. People hated going to church because of these guys. Basically, what it come down to. You know, it's, that's what it would equate to today. People don't want to go to church because you know, the guy behind the pulpit is a crook. Basically, that's what these guys are. They're you know, dipping into what belongs to God. Okay? Now, here's, let's get into this a little bit. Go back to Leviticus chapter 6. Okay? We'll talk about this a little bit. Leviticus chapter 6. See, the priests are supposed to eat sodden flesh. And I've, I've, I've studied this out and I've asked around and I haven't, and this is what I believe the Bible teaches, is that the priests were not to eat roast flesh ever. They were supposed to eat sodden flesh. And, uh, you know, I, this, it's funny how I kind of came to this conclusion. This was, I had a steak dinner with somebody and I made the, uh, the flippant statement that I'm, I'm digging into my, you know, my steak and I say, man, wouldn't it be, you know, sometimes I wish we were still in the Le Levitical law, you know, it would be great to be a priest back then. And the guy I was eating dinner with was just so flabbergasted that I would say, he says, he said, they didn't eat roast flesh, they ate sodden flesh. You didn't know that? And he was just like, you know, taken aback that I didn't understand that. And I was kind of like, oh man, should I have known that, you know? So then I started asking around, I started asking other people, I'm like, hey, what do you think about this? And they're like, I don't know other men of God, you know, other pastors and preachers. I'm like, what do you, what do you think about this? And they're like, you know, I never really thought about it. And we came to the conclusion that it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I did study it out, and I think that that guy was right, that, you know, they were supposed to be eating anything but the sod and flesh. And you see that here in Leviticus chapter 6. He says in verse 25, Speak unto Aaron and to his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest that offer it for sin shall eat it. In the holy place it shall be eaten. In the court of the tabernacle of the congregation, whatsoever shall touch the flesh shall be holy. And when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof upon any garment, thou shalt wash uh, that whereon it is sprinkled in the holy place. But the earthen vessel wherein it was sodden, I mean talking about what he was eating, shall be broken. And if it be sod in a brazen pot, it shall be both scoured and rinsed in water. So what God is saying here is, look, when they're done eating the flesh that I give them, that they are to sod in this pot, you know, he's basically saying, wash your dishes. You know, clean it up. Just break the, but it's, it was a holy thing too. So break the pot, scour the brazen pot. But it's what it's showing us here is that they were to be eating sod and flesh. And what Eli's sons were doing, not only, so to back it up, when they were coming and taking with that flesh hook, and they were taking portions out of other people's meat. That's what was going on. What they were, it was their custom. And it says the priest's servants came and said, and with the flesh hook and whatever the flesh hook brought up, they took unto themselves. So what's going on is the people are showing up with the sacrifice, right? They're slaying the sacrifice. They're getting their portion to eat. They're going and boiling it. And then the priests are coming over there and taking some of their portion. And he's eating that. But that's not enough for these guys. Not only are they getting their portion to eat, that they are to be sod, that they're to boil, that's what sodden means, they're boiling their meat, and they're eating it, but then they're going and taking your portion as well. That we, you know, we, bring a, we bring a sacrifice to them, and they're coming and taking it from us. And not only that, then they're taking gods. Now they're saying, well, that's not enough, we also want roast flesh. And, you know, carnally, we can understand a little bit, right? Because who's ever had boiled steak? I've never even had it. I don't even want to try it. I mean... <laughs> Who would, who would boil a perfectly good piece of meat? You know, you've, we all know you saute that. And some of you guys that are grilling need to get on this. I'm telling you, you saute that steak in a, in a cast iron pan with butter and some rosemary. Anyway. <laughs> Man, preacher makes you hungry. Right? But, but this is what they're doing. I mean, they're taking the roast flesh. They're taking the fat. They're eating that. They're taking, you know, your, the portions that the people are bringing. They're eating their portions. So it's no wonder when we see later in the story when, when Eli falls off his chair and breaks his net, it says, for he was very heavy. It's easy to see how he got there. You know, it wasn't breathing air. It was eating everybody's meat and his and, and the God's too. <coughs> so, so they're taking these portions from everybody else. And not only that, but they used the threat of violence. What did it say there? It said, they said, nay, thou shalt give it me now. And if not, I will take it by force. 
was saying, look, you're going to give us this meat, but we're going to get we're going to get physical. We're going to throw it out and we're going to take it anyway. And he say, well, how could just a couple guys go around to everybody? You think everybody would just rise up and be like, all right, we've had enough. You're not taking our meat. You know what you're doing is wrong. But they uh, it goes to show you that these people probably understood that you know you should not touch the Lord's anointed. They know it was it would have been wrong to you know beat up <laughs> these priest servants. And so that's kind of just my conjecture there. But basically, what's taking place here? Let's bring it into a modern application. Is that the preachers or the priests? You know, the the, the preacher today, the pastor is kind of the equivalent of that day. You know, he's skimming the offering, right? That's basically what's going on here. You know, he's not just taking, you know, the Bible does say the laborer is worthy of his reward. And that they that labor, the, those that labor in the word and doctrine should be kind of worthy of double honor. You know, and it's perfectly biblical, and we don't have time to get into it, that, you know, pastors and deacons, that staff in the church should be paid for their labor, that they have a right to earn a living. You know, but it should be a modest living. You know, it shouldn't be like, oh, I don't know, Kenneth Copeland, for example. He's got to have a private jet or any other one of these big televangelists, Right. They're like, I remember I uh, heard the one, he's like, oh man, I got to have, they're like, why do you got to have this big jet? I can't remember which guy it was. It was some big time televangelist. He's like, well, my ministry, uh, my ministry's to the world. My church is, in the, is the world, brother. I got to be able to go anywhere. I got to be able to fly here and fly there at a moment's notice and help here and help there. Then they look at his flight records. It's like, it seems like a lot of people need help in Hawaii because <laughs> you went there seven times. You know, you took a 45-minute flight to Arkansas to visit your in-laws several times. And it, you know, it costs like $12,000 a flight, you know, or whatever, just to go over there. But, you know, so this isn't anything new. You know, people, bad people go into the ministry often for this exact purpose. To get, make themselves fat on the offerings of the Lord. Those offerings should be made, but they should be used for God's purpose, you know. And to be perfectly honest, you know, Faithful Word Baptist Church has been very blessed in this area. You know, this building itself is a great example of that. The fact that this church plant, because we're a church plant out of Tempe, right, you know, is, is an exact result of the fact that we have a lot of resources to be able to do this kind of thing and, and send a van down here and send a preacher down here to preach and do the soul winning and all the things that we're able to do, you know, it, 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 then none of that would be possible if, you know, if everyone that was you know, on staff got got the idea that, oh, we'll be like Eli's sons, you know, we'll just start. Oh man, we got we got an excess of funds. How about a bonus? Eh, you know, that's wicked. You know, and here's the thing: God won't bless that. And I believe if that ever happened, the funds would dry up, and they'd be, they'd go away. The reason why God has allowed this church to prosper, you know, in that way, is because He knows that the money that comes into this ministry goes right back into the work of the Lord. You know, in the soul winning and, and everything and so on and so forth. But these guys, Samuel's sons, are, you know, and even guys today that get in the ministry for the wrong reasons, they're there to just skim off the top. They're just there to take more than is their, uh, they deserve. And people who do that, they're wicked. Okay? It says they're sons of Belial, and this is what they do. They steal from God. And, you know, that doesn't mean that every guy that does that is a reprobate. But I will say this. Every guy that does that has something in common with a reprobate. Right. <laughs> the Bible says, uh, let's, let's move on here. In verse 18, it says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with the linen ephod. So while all this is going on, while all of this corruption is taking place, we're to the point where the people are abhorring the, the offering of the Lord, this boy Samuel is there ministering before the Lord. You know, and he is pure as the wind-driven snow. I mean, he, he's not doing any of this. He's not part He might not even know what's going on. I don't know. But he's there, and the Bible says that he was ministering uh, before the Lord. And what I love about it is that, and if you would look at verse 21, it says, and, and, the Lord, and the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And child, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. So he's there, he's ministering, he's growing, and it says in verse 26, And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor with both the Lord and also with men. So despite all this corruption, he's still growing in the Lord. He's still prospering in the Lord. And I think this is an important lesson that we need to learn is that, you know, you can serve God in the worst circumstances. You can still be faithful to God in the worst circumstances, and you can also fail Him in the best. You know, sometimes we get this idea that, you know, our church has to be perfect. The preacher's got to be perfect. 
our family has to be perfect, our jobs have to be perfect in order for everything to go right. That's not the case. I mean, Samuel's here with straight up reprobates in the house of God, you know, and, and he still manages to grow before the Lord in favor with man and God. He still managed to be faithful and move on with his life and serve God in, the, in a terrible set of circumstances. So that's what we should realize too is that, you know, your circumstances aren't always going to determine success. That's not what's going to determine your success. What's going to determine your success is this right here. Where's your heart at? Amen. What's the condition is your heart in? You know, and I hear from people all the time, like, oh, you know, we don't have a church like your church and where we live. You know, wish we could get one. Boy, I'd love to go to church like your church and blah, 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 blah. They send emails. It's like, well, I'm sure there's a good enough church where you're at. I'm sure there's churches here in Tucson that anybody could go to and, and, and learn to love God and, and read the book and, and serve God and, and have a good Christian life. Even though it's not the best church or the perfect church, you know, newsflash, the per perfect church doesn't exist. You know, and, and if it did, we would ruin it, as has been said. You know, if the perfect church existed, the moment I walk through the door, it's ruined because I'm not perfect and neither are any of us. So we shouldn't just let our circumstances, you know, determine whether or not we're going to succeed in the Christian life. It's certainly, Samuel. I, let, let me just put you at ease. You, you don't have a son of Belial for a preacher today. Okay, I'm not. Right? Of course, that's exactly what a son of Belial would say. <laughs> right? But no, honestly. But here's the thing. Even if I were, you know, you could still succeed. You know, you, you know uh, the man of God can mess up and make a mess of things. And, you know, churches can still go on and people can still serve God. But they have to get over that. You know, they have to see beyond their, their circumstances or the failings of others. I mean, Samuel could have been like, thanks, Mom. Oh, gee, thanks for dropping me off with a bunch of wicked reprobates who are just stealing from the house, of, you know, stealing the offering and making themselves fat. Oh, really appreciate it. Thanks for the coat, Mom. That's not what he did. Man, he put that ephod on, and he went out there and he served God despite his, you know, these circumstances that he was, he was in. Amen. Oh, where were we at? So here, you know, bottom line, don't let, you know, other people's sins be your excuse to join them, you know. And, that, and, and it all goes back to people, you know, just sometimes they just, they let other people's shortcomings be their excuse to be a failure themselves. And that's not right. You know, we shouldn't look for these ideal circumstances. But let's move on from that point. It says in verse 19 going on here, it says, Moreover, his mother made him a little coat, and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Now, I, I talked about this on Mother's Day. You know, how about the fact that she had to think about that coat every year. She's, remember, she's coming only once a year to Samuel. And she's bringing this coat. So every year, she's got to sit down and think about, well, how big does that coat need to be? You know, and she's gathering the fat. And I talked about how that's how we as, well, not we, but you mothers need to be. Um, you know, and dads too, they need to think of that along these lines is that, you know, how, you know, how are you, what are you weaving into the fabric, you know, uh, your, your child's life? You know, what are, are, are you, are you, do you have forethought, you know, for what's ahead for your children? You know, I don't want to repeat all that. That w it is there, so I'll mention it. And it says in verse 20, And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman. And we, and we read all that. Let's jump down to uh, verse 22. Now Eli, this was the, the high priest who had the two wicked sons, right? Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. I mean, if that's not bad enough, if, it's, if, if everything that they're doing isn't bad enough in the house of God, I mean, they're stealing from the people. They're taking what belongs to God for themselves. Not only that, but they're also committing fornication with the people that come to church. These guys are wicked. You know, and, and I don't want to go on and on about that, but this is how wicked these guys are. And so Eli, you know, it says he hears all this. And in verse 23, And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Now, now that's a pretty, in my opinion, that's a very stern rebuke. Is it enough? No. And he goes on and it says, Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of the Father, because the Lord would slay them. You know, and that all ties in with the fact that, they're a, that they are a reprobate. 
There's, that's what a reprobate is, to be rejected of the Lord. And people can reach a point where God rejects them, and the only thing that's waiting for them is destruction. And that's a whole other sermon. But, you know, as certain as this, this is, and I believe it is, because, I mean, he, it, everything he said here is true, is it not? I mean, he says, look, if one man sin against another, the judge shall judge. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat? I mean, that's a true statement. You know, if you, if you, if you, you know, get out of sorts with God, if you're going to start messing with the Lord and make him your enemy, you don't stand a chance. That's what he's saying here. <clears throat> you know, if you, mess, if, if you get into it with another person, you know, you know, you have a chance with the judge. You know, they, maybe you'll get shown mercy or whatever. But when you're, you know, with God, there is no, he is the judge. You know, you don't have a chance. <clears throat> but as strong as that is, and I believe it is, Eli doesn't have any excuses, does he? And if you would, go to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Because if you remember, part of the, his priestly duties was to teach the word of God. You know, and he would have had the law of Moses at this time. And he would have known what should have taken place with his sons. The proper uh, punishment for his sons. You know, he, he should have known what the law prescribed for Hophni and Phinehas. Which were, what were Hophni and Phinehas? They were stubborn. They were rebellious and they were gluttons. Those are all those are words that describe them to a T. Now look here at Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. It says, This is the law. Okay, this is an opinion. This is what the Bible says. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son. Now, who do we just read about that has a stubborn and rebellious son's Eli, right? Which shall not obey the voice of his father. They hearken not. Or the voice of his mother, and that they have chastened them, and they will not hearken unto him them. Then his father and his mother shall lay hold on him, and shall bring him out to the elders of the city, of his city, and of the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. That's Hophni and Phineas. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city, the city shall stone him with stones, that he die. I mean, God prescribes the death penalty for these guys. That's what it should have happened. That, excuse me. That's what should have happened to Hophni and Phineas. That's what Eli should have done. And he said, "You guys won't hear me. I hear what you're doing. You're gluttons. You're stubborn. You're rebellious. You know, you're fornicating. You know, that's which is just another form of gluttony. You know, and he, he should have lay hold on them, took me over to the city, and said, I don't care who they are. I don't care whose sons they are. I don't care if they're the priests." They're broken the commandments, right. and they needed to die. Then maybe people wouldn't have abhorred the offering of the Lord. Right. And again, we've, I've talked about this passage. You know, we just went through the entire book of Deuteronomy. And when we got to this point, we pointed out the fact that this isn't talking about children. You know, like small, like a child. You know, you can, I, I'm somebody's child today, but that doesn't make me a little person, does it? Yeah. Right? You can still grow, be an adult and still be a child. That's what this is prescribed for. Grown men who are going to continue to be lazy, drunks, and won't hearken unto their mother or father. That's the prescription the Bible gives. Now it says, uh, you know, that's, that, now that, that's what Eli should have done. Of course he didn't. And <coughs> Eli's rebuke, you know, is a stern rebuke. I believe that. It just simply had no effect. And why, you know, part of the reason why it might have had no effect on these guys is because his sons were sons of Belial. And what are sons? Or, what are, or excuse me, what are, what are sons of Belial? They're reprobates. And what are reprobates? They're implacable. They, can't be argue, they cannot be placated. They cannot be reasoned with. They're hard-hearted. That's part of the reason I think they didn't hearken. Part of the other reason is, is probably that it was, you know, he was old when he finally decides to do this. Meaning it was too little, too late. You know, and that should be a, a warning to all of us parents. That if you just let your kids, you know, what we, you know, you let this slide, you let this little thing slide, you let this little thing slide, and then it gets a little bit bigger. Now it's a little bit of a bigger sin. Yeah, but we let that slide, and we let that slide, and we let it go, we let it go, and we don't deal with our kids, we don't, we don't, you know, uh, practice biblical chastisement. We don't deal with them like the Bible says we should, you know, with spankings and so on and so forth. And we let them grow up and become rebellious people. It eventually gets to the point where it's too little, too late. There's no bringing them back. They're gone. Now, I'm not saying they're reprobate, but I'm saying they're going to they're, they're be hard-headed. They're going to you know, stay in there. Uh, you know, apart from the grace of God, they're going to continue down that path. 
but I think a big reason why Hophni and Phineas just blew off their dad was because Eli was partaker with their sin. And I've already talked about this a little bit, but he was a hypocrite. If you look there at verse 29, when the man of God comes and rebukes Eli to his face, he says, Wherefore he kick ye at my sacrifice and at my offering, and you know, he's speaking on behalf of the Lord, which I have commanded my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of the offerings of all the people of Israel, my people. He said you make yourselves fat. He didn't say to, for them to make themselves, you know, themselves fat. You make yourselves fat. Which shows us that, you know, Eli was partaking in this. Eli, and maybe he piped up in the past like, what are you guys doing taking the fat from the altar? Why are you taking extra meat from the people's offering? You know, that, don't you have enough? Oh, here, Dad, shut up. Here, Dad has some fat. Oh, I, I do like fat. And maybe that's what was going on. But he, you know, it, <laughs> again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. When he, when he dies and it says that he was a, he was a, a heavy man, how do you think that happened? Yep. It's because he's right there with him. Yep. Sucking up all the fat with him. And uh, <laughs> another lesson here is that, you know, God holds Eli accountable for his son's behavior. You know, God, I mean, who was committing, you know, that's another, should show us that, you know, he was partaking in the sin with them. Because he says, you know, you're making yourselves fat. Well, let's move on here. It says in verse 26, And the child Samuel grew on and was uh, in both favor with man, with the Lord, and also with men. And then we read, uh, verse 27, There came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto thy father's house that were in the Egypt and in Pharaoh's house? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer up upon mine altar? And he says, uh, To burn incense, to wear an ephod before me. He's saying, Look, you know, you're a son of Levi. You have a very privileged position. You know, that was, I could have done that with anybody, but I chose your father to, to have that position of serving me. You know, not everyone gets to do that. You know, it's, it's an honor unto you. You know, isn't that enough? And did I give unto thy father house all the offerings made by fire, the children of Israel? He's saying, didn't I give you what you needed? Didn't I give you to eat? Didn't I give you uh, this, this position and the ability to, you know, to, 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 to provide for yourself? He says, Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation. Jump down to verse 30. Wherefore, the Lord of God Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father shall walk before me forever. But now, saith the Lord. You know, and that's a really important principle to understand is that God can break his promises. That God changes his mind. That the, that the covenant he makes isn't always, you know, there are exceptions. That sometimes it's not an everlasting covenant. I mean, is that what he just said? I said indeed that thy house and thy house of thy father should walk me before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be, be it far from me. He said, no, I changed my mind. <clears throat> For them that honor me will I honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come, I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in thy, my habitation, and all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. He's saying, look, all your family is going to die young. All, the, all, all the, the generations to come are going to die young. And we know the story here. That's exactly what happens with his sons. They die young. And he says, And a man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be, no, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve, uh, grieve thine heart. And all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. He said they're not going to live a long life. They're going to die in the flower. You know, and they're just blooming. You know, they're going to die young. And this shall be a sign unto thee, and that shall come uh, upon thy two sons. He's saying, look, and just to prove that what I'm saying is true, here's what's going to happen. Uh, uh, thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, and one day they shall die, both of them. Saying everything that I said, you know, is going to happen, and here's how I'm going to prove it to you, Eli is that one day both your kids are going to die. Hophni and Phinehas are going to die. And I will raise me up a faithful priest who sh that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. Now, you know, he's talking about Samuel, but I also believe that could be prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. Now he says he walk before mine anointed. Who's he talking about? Who's the anointed there? He's talking about God's people. You know, we are his anointed. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left in thine house shall come to crouch to him for a piece of silver and for a morsel of bread and shall put 
and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, in one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread. So he starts out by saying, Look, I gave you everything. I gave you the sacrifices to eat. You had this position. And he said, And because of what you've done, now they're going to come and say, You know, give me, a, give me a piece of silver or a morsel of bread. And uh, <laughs> what this shows us, really, and I'll wrap it up here, is that, you know, Hannah had a better understanding of the Lord than even Eli did, didn't she? The man of God. Just a humble woman, you know, just trying to be faithful to God. She had a better understanding of God than Eli did, of who God was. She understood that God, you know, lifts, you know, the, the, we'll look at verse 3, the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. She understood that. And uh, <coughs> she understood that, you know, God lifts up one and brings down another. And that God looks on the heart, that God weighs our actions and reacts accordingly. Eli didn't get that. I mean, he, I don't know why, what was going on here. He didn't understand what was going to take place. He just lets all this go on. And it just seems like Hannah knew better than him. <coughs> but, you know, Eli's words probably would have carried more weight if he hadn't been such a hypocrite. And that's really kind of what I want to take away here in the end is that, and I know I, I, I alluded to this last time we were, t we were in Samuel, but... The Bible says, or it was Sunday morning, it says, an hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. Right? And, that, and Eli is a perfect example of that. Eli was a hypocrite that ended up destroying his own children and his lineage. I mean, destroyed everything with his hypocrisy. <coughs> so, we need to really watch out for that, especially as parents. I mean, no, we don't want to be a, a hypocrite in an area of life because of what it'll do to our neighbor. You know, like I said in Sunday morning, you know, we don't want to be somebody else's excuse for, for quitting on God or, or disregarding the Bible. You know, we don't want to be that to other people. Um, but especially when it comes to being a parent, you know, that would be a real grief of heart. At least it should be. And here's the thing, you know, and now all the kids are like, yeah, I got my parents wherever I want them. If I see any hypocrisy, you know, it doesn't make it right, kids. It doesn't give you the, it's not a, it doesn't, it's not a license because your parents, oh, my parents aren't perfect. You know, ipso facto, it's okay for me to just go run wild and disregard the commandments of the Lord. No. Right. I mean, look at, look, at, uh, look, at, uh, look at Samuel. I mean, Eli, in a sense, was raising that boy. He was his dad to him in a lot of ways. I mean, she left him, Hannah left him in his care. And he was overseeing him and protect. And really, he did do a good job in some sense that he protected him from two complete reprobates. You know. But, you know, that he could be an example of, of, of prospering, you know, even when the person who's over you is a bit of a hypocrite or a big one like Eli. And I don't just mean physically, like <laughs> he was a hypocrite. But uh, here's the thing, you know, no parent is perfect, right? No perfect, there's no perfect parent, like there's no perfect church. But, you know, and, and, and we don't expect as parents to be perfect, but, you know, being a blatant hypocrite is what will destroy your children. And it's what's going to destroy the remembrance of you, like we talked about earlier. So, you know, Hannah, she raised a godly ch a, a child, right? And she's fondly remembered in Psalms. Remember when we talked about that? How she, she, she gave, you know, uh, Samuel was, you know, a very godly man. And David later, you know, looks back on Hannah and quotes her. And she's, she's remembered in the Psalms in a very positive light. But why is that? It's because she wasn't a hypocrite. She followed through on her vow, right? She said, and then she did. She said, I'll give him, lend him unto the Lord. And the, that child came, and what'd she do? She lent him unto the Lord. You know, her talk matched her walk. So you kind of see the two extremes here, right? With Eli and Hannah. You know, one was a hypocrite and lost everything and is, is you know, despised in Scripture. He's a, he's a shame and a reproach unto this day. You know, his story's recorded just like Hannah's. You know, and then you have Hannah. Her story is recorded. Her prayer is recorded. It's reiterated, and even and even elaborated. You know, and, and she's brought up again. And what's the difference? One was a hypocrite. One wasn't. So we have to decide what we want. What do we want to be remembered for? Do we want to remember like a Hannah? People look back and they think of us fondly, and they and they appreciate what we were and what we did. Or do we want to look back and be remembered like an Eli? You know. Just somebody who was a total hypocrite. I think everybody in the room would probably want to take after Hannah more than Eli, right? But again, that's not going to happen by itself. We have to determine to do that. We have to say, 
you know, I'm going to live for the Lord, I'm going to be faithful, and I'm going to, uh, you know, continue in the things of God. Otherwise, you know, we, we can make a mess of things. Let's go ahead and pray.